the Quinn Mar Show. This show is brought to you by Bing Pot Trivia. How many times have you been to a trivia night where it just felt like somebody reading questions? Well, Bing Pot Trivia prides themselves on bringing high energy, dynamic hosts to every event. The show leans heavily on visual elements. Their questions are designed to make you laugh or roll your eyes, while also challenging your knowledge on pop culture, high school science, culinary arts, and everything in between. Their typical show runs five rounds, including a photo round, general knowledge on pop culture, riffs on different game shows, absurd 50-50 questions, and a super sweet music round. Check out bingpottrivia.com today to book your trivia night. Again, that is a bingpottrivia.com. Tell my boy Danny that your friend Quinn sent you. All right, let's get on with the show. My next guest can be described as a pioneer of the YouTube game. Starting his channel back in 2006, he succeeded in every part of the word. From being one of the most subscribed creators in the first five months of posting to hosting the red carpet for the Teen Choice Awards, he's basically done it all. He's now out of the social media world and living a much quieter life. It is my pleasure to welcome to the Quinn Mar Show, Michael Buckley. Michael, what's going on? Hello, and thank you for the rousing introduction. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much for being here. I'm fired up. 12-year-old me is so excited. Oh, man. Well, well 32-year-old me thanks you for having 48-year-old me on your show. So, hello. <laughs> that throws me off because I'm going to be 28. And you did you start when you were 32? I mean, in 2006, <laughs> I was 31. So, yeah. Oh, wow. So, no, never mind. So, I was 10. I take that back. I wasn't even 12. I was 10. <laughs> Hello, and your parents let you watch me. I remember going to YouTube events and meeting kids and being like, "Do do there do what?" I'm, I think I'm swearing a lot. I think I'm <laughs> saying inappropriate things. But hello, thank you for watching. So. Well, it's funny because um, probably I'm gonna say 99% of the stuff you said probably went over my head, like the inappropriate stuff, 100%. Yeah, <clears throat> there was one uh, before we get into it. There was one summer. Actually, it would have been that summer, about 2006, 2007, eight maybe. Um. During the summer, I found my dad's Dave Chappelle, like the Chappelle Show DVDs. So I just watched it all the time when I was home alone. So the stuff you said was nothing compared to Chappelle. Thank you. I take great comfort in that. <laughs> so yeah, let's, I really just, we need to get into this because like I said, you went from like one of the top guys to like quiet, gone, done. So we'll start from the beginning. So you grew up in Connecticut. I want to know what was a young Michael like? What were your ho like? I want to know your hobbies. Were you always like an entertaining guy, like needing to be like the guy in the room? I don't think. I mean, maybe <laughs> yes, a little bit. I think when I was very small, I felt very weird. I think all like gay kids look back at age four, five, six, seven with. I definitely had a sense I didn't fit well in the world. I didn't know if it was going to. <laughs> You know, I, I think I was always very amused by myself. I think I had a good sense of humor, even at a young age. Um, I was very into television. I had a wild, active imagination. I was watching very adult television programs at age four, five, and six. So it's funny that you said, you know, you were 10 watching me. I was age five watching very kind of adult sitcoms. No idea what the joke's about, but I still was delighted by it all. Um, but yeah, I was, I was a weird kid. I was weird. I was silly. I was, um, and I do think I probably liked attention by around fifth grade until then I really was pretty nervous and shy ish, um, in social settings. And then by fifth grade, I started doing theater. And I do think that was the moment that I did get a little attention. And I was like, oh, this is nice. Like, this is nice. And I liked acting. I liked, you know, I, I at age 10, I think I probably had a bit of disdain and dislike for myself. And so as many 10 year olds do. And so I do think acting was a nice way just to play someone else and enjoy escaping from myself. So I definitely, as a young child, I don't know if I felt like the center of attention, but by age 10, I definitely was like, oh, I think I could, I think I could enjoy being the center of attention right like for me um nothing makes me feel happier than like or like get just get me fired up like if i have like a room full of people or a group full of people I'm making them laugh like that to me is like one of the best feelings ever you put me up in front of people for a presentation no shot i hate i, I hate that too like no end it's, it's a really weird dynamic so I, I it's interesting that it took you up until the theater so before that like what were like your hobbies at the time like were they were you just like 
into TV? Were you into books? Were you into science? Like, do you remember like what that one thing for you was or many? Oh, I had lots of interests and hobbies. Like I love television. I love sitcoms. I loved gymnastics. I I mean, before around age eight, nine, I fell in love with gymnastics and I loved watching the Olympics. Uh, I also was a big comic book reader. I collected Wonder Woman and Superman and Batman and Justice League and the Teen Titans and a lot of the DC library. So a lot of my childhood was television, comic books, and then wildly in love with Olympics and sports and stuff. And I, I think the thing I loved about the Olympics was it was so theatrical. Like it felt like I was watching the performance mm -hmm. of a lifetime on this grand world stage. So I do remember being nine years old and like falling in love with the Olympics. I have a lot of, you know, interesting memories like that. And I'm still the same. Like the moment we get off of this, I'm going to just hop on SEC network and be watching NCAA gymnastics all night. So a lot of my interests have changed at almost 50 years old, mm -hmm. but a lot of my interests are still my childhood interests and passion. I love that. That, that I mean, Hey, everyone, is still a kid at heart, right? No matter what it is, like if it's something you still like to watch or something you still like to do it, like at the end of the day, we're all kind of like in this, in the same boat. Right. So getting into the theater, what do you remember what it was like? Were you just like, Oh, I'll try this was it, or cause you watch TV. You're like, Oh, I could try to do that kind of, Oh, thing. I could tell you the entire story. And from start to detail, I could tell you my opening. So it was fifth grade. They were doing a production of The Electric Sunshine Man, which was a show about Thomas Edison. I did not know I was auditioning, but the teacher called us all <laughs> into the hallway and made us read. And she just said, Michael, be as loud as you can. Oh, which God. Meant you can hear me talking right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if the the measure of success to get the starring role was going to be the loudest kid, I went out there and I at opened up my mouth and I was cast immediately as the Electric Sunshine Man, Thomas Edison. And I didn't know I was necessarily the star, but I remember, and this is you remember these things. I remember at the read through. I had all of the lines and everybody else had one line. So I remember just sitting there like, oh, this is good. It's a good thing I was so loud in that hallway. <laughs> and I had pages of monologues and everybody else would just come on and have like one line. And so I knew I was the star of the show. And, you know, and it's funny because I used to do stand up and I would tell this story about when I came out for the curtain call of that show and it's, you know, 1986. So we had like a VHS copy of this show. Everybody bowed, a company bow. And then there's little 10 year old me walking to center stage and bowing <laughs> and everybody stands up and you could just see my little face be like, Oh, Oh, I'm the man. And that was like the moment. Oh, I'm kind of screwed for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like, how can I generate this positive emotion of being adored by the fellow children, the faculty and the parents who are looking at me, the electric sunshine man? I love that. Like my brain was telling me, I get I might as well have been the star of like, you know, Star Wars as far yeah. as I knew that was like as big as what I was doing in Wallingford, Connecticut. <laughs> That's so funny. Speaking of parents, what did your parents do for like day jobs? Like did, were they, in, were they, did they have the same interests as you for like theater wise? I know my dad had worked in insurance. So I'm from Connecticut and that is known as the insurance capital of America. And so my father worked in insurance. My mother was uh, a stay at home mom for my childhood. She did get into real estate when I was in middle school, but yeah, growing up, no, my dad worked, uh, you know, very successfully and my mother was home with us and I, you know, I don't, yeah, my mother was just funny. Like, I always think my mother was funny and she did to me seem like a mother in a sitcom. So I do think like that was the, I enjoyed her sense of humor and I definitely feel like I used to want to be funny to make her laugh, which right. then became right. Ultimately me on YouTube, just making videos, trying yeah. to make people laugh. So no, right. I just, yeah, my parents, yeah. You know, I was lucky they encouraged me and let me do theater because it is, I think as a grown up, it is, you know, you're lucky if your parents exposure, if they put you in that sport, you're interested in it. If they put you in theater, you're interested in it. And, you know, so I'm, I feel very grateful that I was exposed to the arts and I did find 
And that was the thing too. I remember in sixth grade, I remember just the director really <laughs> believing in me, which at this age, I remember, like, I remember this man looking at me and believing in me. And I don't know if I believed in myself that much in sixth grade, but I just remember taking his belief and carrying it for myself. I remember that. I remember that from almost 40 years ago, this man. And I think that's any great teacher, that's any great coach, that's any great role model in your life. I remember this man believed in me in sixth grade and I carried that with me for the rest of my life. That's amazing. And and that's pretty cool that he was able to see like the potential too back then. You know what I mean? Like yeah. not everybody can do that. He clearly yeah. had the eye. Now, what really interested me going through just like your life how the hell did you go from a guy that was so into theater, a kid, to graduating with a degree in psychology? So that's another interesting story that, um, oh my God. So all I wanted to be was an actor. And I had been the lead in like many of the school plays. And so I really, you know, I thought, like I remember, I didn't think of any sort of other backup plan. As far as I knew, I was going to be an actor. I was going to go to LA. I was going to go be a star who, whatever, no idea how to do that. Uh, but I was still in my brain was like, that's what I'm going to do. And then I remember going, <laughs> going to the high school guidance counselor, who was also one of the directors of the theater. And, um, and he, you know, said, what do you want to major in? And I said, theater. And he said, no. And it was amazing. Cause like now as a grown up, I'm like, like literally talk about, like, I'm talking about someone who believed in me. It's like, not even maybe, maybe I'd like to major in theater. No. That's so weird that they're like, they sound like they're so admin, just like not a chance. Not yeah, like was, you said, not maybe or no. And he just said, theater is a very difficult field to go into. And then I named someone who was also one of the leads in the musical. And I said, Lenny is majoring in theater. And he said, Lenny is very good looking. What the heck? This is what this man said to a 16 year old covered in pimples, very, you know, whatever. I, so again, go into theater. I want to go into theater. It's very challenging. Lenny's going into theater. Lenny is very good looking. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, not only am I a shitty actor, but I'm apparently. <laughs> and you're ugly actor. too, apparently. I'm hideous. I'm hideous. Were you, um, were you, were you out by then? No. Oh no. my God. That's even worse. No, it was 1992. There was not any out people at my high oh. school. There was no gay straight alliance. There was oh. none of that. But um, honestly, I was ultimately my life worked out so beautifully and perfectly that on no planet am I sitting here thinking, I wish that I had gone and been a musical theater major. Um, you know, when it was time to pick a major of the list of topics, the only thing that I was remotely interested in was psychology. And so I feel like I got to go and have a great liberal arts education and I still got to do theater. I ended up being the lead in many of the productions that if I had gone to a theater school, I probably would have, you know, struggled or not been as good. But I, I went to a small college. I got to play a lot of great parts and I got a degree in psychology. And so, but yeah, it is funny that I was discouraged from majoring in theater, which is fine. But it is funny that again, my, my physical appearance was brought up and I was like, oh my God. Like now I don't think, I think teachers are, you know, learn to coach and talk with a little more compassion than draw attention to. And again, I certainly wasn't hideous, but I just <laughs> love <laughs> you're not good looking enough. Yeah, okay. but that, that's so crazy. Like I like you said, like you would hope, I mean they shouldn't have done it then, but you'd hope teachers aren't doing that now. Yeah. Just say apply, apply, see what happens. Good luck. Versus yeah. you're basically ugly. you're ugly is what he you're was ugly. saying. I know. That's that's, that's nuts. And like I said, like it, it was even worse because like were were you struggling with not being out yet? I don't know. Oh God. It's so funny because it's so long ago to answer that question feels like I almost have to remember my memory of the memory. So to answer the question, was I struggling with not being out? No, because I don't, I knew I was gay, but it never occurred to me that I was going to tell anybody anytime soon. Oh, okay. So I did. I wasn't sitting there thinking I need to come out because right. people were, I did not know any gay people. There were not right. any, there was, this was before Ellen DeGeneres or Elton John or Rosie O'Donnell or Neil Patrick Harris or people who were out invisible. So it never occurred to me to tell anybody I was gay. I just think I thought 
I'm gay and someday perhaps I'll act on it. <laughs> right, right. And, that's, and and like you're talking about like people not like visibly being out, especially yeah. in Connecticut. Yeah, it, I'm good. Like there was, I'd never met a gay person that was out. So it's not like I was interacting with any gay people. You yeah. Know? This, this is a side note, but I hope one day, and I mean, I'm sure you feel the same way. It, it won't have to be such a big deal when someone comes out. You know what I mean? I don't think it is. I mean, this is 30 years ago, at least. Right. I think people come out all the time now. Right. And it's not that big a deal. I right. do think it's a much safer world to come out in. Thank God. And, uh, yeah, I feel much, I feel grateful for that. You know, right. I feel yeah. grateful for that, for the, for the kids who don't, need to negotiate their self-worth or think being gay is less than right. even though you know primitive christianity in some parts of america would like homosexuals to think that you know they've chosen a less than path and so uh -huh. again uh -huh. i i was born this way i am i am more happy and successful than any straights i know so good for me <laughs> exactly exactly um it's funny well not funny but like like I said earlier, like you have really done a lot. Like you, you definitely have worn a lot of hats because I was reading that you worked at a group home. Yeah. For a bit as well. So were you doing that while you were working at the theater directing? So, yeah, I mean, my, my, so out of college, I started working at uh, a residential group home for autistic kids. Mm -hmm. And I was doing like a lot, like th that was like my years out of college where I was working full time at that job. I was directing and choreographing theater. And I was also like training to be a figure skater just randomly. Like it was such an interesting, funny time for like a 23 year old <clears throat> who was just uh, I don't know. I just throwing a little baloney against the wall and seeing like, could I nurture all these interests and passions? And I loved working with the kids. It was very low paying, but very fulfilling. Um, I love directing theater, but I certainly wasn't necessarily monetizing that. Um, and I loved skating and I really did think I was going to go and compete at some point. So it was just a, a goofy, fun time in my life before my next chapter, which ended up being a different job. And then my YouTube chapter. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I, cause I mean, speaking of the directing choreography, so you did into the woods and then leader of the pack. And you also starred in Charlie and the chocolate factory and little women. Yes. I was in lots of theater back in the day. Yeah. Who were you in Charlie and the chocolate factory? I was Willy Wonka. No, I mean, why did I even ask? Of course you were. And, and the script was awful. So I very illegally just sat <laughs> The, the script that we had was awful. So I remember just sitting there. And again, it's 1998. I'm watching Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, the movie on VHS. And I'm basically just typing up a script and I show up in the thing like, this is what we're doing. Right. <laughs> I, yeah. I, mean, like, I'm just, I think that's illegal. I think we have the rights for a different show. And I just said, we're doing this. Um, but yeah, no, I love doing theater and I will tell you, I'm not that great an actor. Like I would be a much better actor now, but like back in the day, I wasn't a great actor. I wasn't a great singer. I wasn't a great dancer. I was just very hardworking and I wanted it. Like I definitely just love doing it, but I'm not naturally like a good actor, but it's it. But I get, I did it. I did it. I was a decent, I gave some decent performances over the years. Well, I'm just going to say, I mean, like you you probably were no slouch. Like, yeah, you have to work like some people will work hard enough to get into it, but there has to be some talent involved. There's no way you just like didn't have any talent. I was moderately talented as an actor. That's, there you that's go. I'm hey, hey. being honest with my assessment. I was a moderately talented actor. Yes. That's more than a lot of people can say. Yes. Right. Yes. So, um, and then I read, it was funny because when I was doing the research on you, well, it said when you moved back to Connecticut to work for Live Nation, it said you started, go, you went back to a normal job as if like the other jobs weren't normal which was kind of weird. Like, it's not like those weren't normal jobs. So it's funny that that's how it was uh, presented. But what, how did you get the, into the Live Nation and what was your role there? So my ex-husband got a job at Live Nation. He was hired to do um, season tickets and Broadway subscription stuff, and he loved it. And a month into him working there, the executive director of the theater was looking for an executive assistant. I had no idea to, how to do something like that. He was like, do you know Excel or PowerPoint? I'm like, I know none of these things. But um, I think because my husband did work there and they did like him, I went in to get a job interview. And the man, Randy, who was one of my dear friends still, he hired me. And I, I was an executive assistant slash office manager from uh, June of 2002 to September 2008. So again, that was, you know, I had started there and then I picked up YouTube as a hobby about three years into that. So I did stay at that job for 
you know, about two years while I was still sitting there being an executive assistant and then sitting over here replying to comments. On well, we'll, we'll get into that because that's actually really interesting. The fact that you were the what the buck guy yeah. while you still had a, a normal job, we'll get into it because that, yeah. that's 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 interesting. Um, so what was your like, day to day like at Live Nation? Like obviously you're an assistant, but like what, what were the kind of things you're doing? I mean, admin work, like I was, because I was the assistant to the executive director, I had my hands in operations and finance and uh, marketing and just anything he had his hands in. And so I loved it. It was, uh, I felt very valuable. It's interesting because in my work life now, I always tell people, I was probably the lowest paid person in the office, but I probably felt like the most important and most valuable because I did. I had a lot of responsibility. I had a lot of positive relationships with everybody in every department and I learned a lot and I'm still great friends with a lot of those people. It was a really fun place to work. And I mean, Live Nation is concerts and, uh, entertainment. And basically for those six years, I saw every single artist I ever wanted to see for free. That's and awesome. So it was just a wonderful, fun job that was a lot of admin work, but also just a lot of fun getting to go to these shows. I, lo I, I like that you loved it too, because I like you that. said, like you were you were one of the lowest paid guys but, but you acted like, like you were one of the i am i am someone i worked at burger king when i was 16 i loved it i worked at the supermarket deli when i was 18 i loved it i worked at live nation as like a uh, an executive assistant i loved it i've loved every job i love working i love right. being of value to anything and so i have just always been you know, very into work. I love work. I love achievement. I love success. And even though, like I said, I wasn't like the president of the company, I still went to, to work every day and I felt like I was adding value and that I was an important part of the team. And that, that, no, that's amazing. That's clearly like, I mean, that's beyond saying you have work ethic. Like, you know what I mean? Like great work ethic. Like that's, that's above that. That's, that's, that's awesome. The fact that you just like love to work. I mean, and that shows you've lived like three lives and, and you're not even 50. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's yeah, 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 yeah. And a lot, a lot of people, including myself, could only have like a a part of that work ethic because that's no, that's insane. Now, the, you, the time you appeared on TV with your friend, Christian, Cr Kristen, Kristen. So Kristen. yes, that was how, where did how did that happen? So that is actually basically my YouTube origin story. In that. I, okay. So I did say I wanted to be an actor. I did acknowledge I wasn't a very good actor. And so by the time it was like 2002 to five ish, I was thinking I'd like to do something in the entertainment industry. And I do think that I would be a very good television type host. And so I started playing with the idea that I would somehow go to LA or New York, or I would be either a red carpet reporter or one of those people on E who's just like, and in breaking news, Britney Spears says, what like, I just thought you'd be great at that. <laughs> um, and so, and I also started watching TV shows and writing jokes down, which seems bananas, but I remember just watching Survivor and just writing down jokes. I don't know what I thought I was gonna do with them, but I just thought I'm gonna be a TV presenter who's ready to tell jokes about things. And so I went to a TV hosting seminar and they basically, you pay like $300 and you meet very low level people in their companies who just give you generic advice. <laughs> and so again, I would never encourage anybody to do that. But the one thing one gal said was, you need to get yourself on tape. So we have footage of you. So I was like, hmm, I need to get myself on tape. This is before there was a camera phone. This was before the, like it, it required work. And so I remember- and money, right? anything. So I'm going to go down to the local public access studio in Wallingford, Connecticut, and I'm going to start a one hour talk show with my girlfriend, Kristen. And so in May of 2005 and the night before I spent 18 hours writing material, which Jeez. again, bananas work ethic, uh -huh. but, you know, and my husband was looking at me in the dining room, like writing out jokes and writing out stories. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. I said, I just have a feeling this might be something. So would you let me just see if this is something? And he was lovely and said, whatever, of course. And so, you know, for the next three years on Monday night at seven o'clock, we would show up and we would do this 
local public access show called Table for Two. It would stream live into Wallingford, Connecticut. And I was so into it, I would make copies and I would send them out to 40 other places in Connecticut. But also I was taking those tapes, taking them home and turning them into clips that I could send out to casting people. That's crazy. The fact that you were cutting clips then is insane to me. And it was not easy. <laughs> like, it was not, just, like, like you had all like the technology to do it, like no uh, problem. You know what I mean? Like right now, I can download the app CapCut. Yep. Two seconds, I have a clip. That's yep. insane. So yeah. So I mean, that was the show. And then I mean, I don't know what, what's your next question. Well, I was just going to be about um, how you had a segment. Was it yeah. the segment was called What the Buck? Not so. Uh, it's funny because. I was, I got hired. So one of the things that I got cast in, I did get cast in was like an MTV two pilot presentation for some music show. So for what I had done enough in my tape submission, I went on an audition and it's funny because I looked like I, you know, I had the blazer on the t-shirt on the glasses on. I had kind of come up with this branding for myself <clears throat> and they called me like Buck the Hustler or something Buck. <laughs> I don't know. All I know is my MySpace name was Buck the Hustler back That's in two, whatever. Based on, and I don't think this show ever aired. There was, I can't even tell you how many pilots I shot over those 10 years. I'm like, I was in this pilot with, I have no idea what happened to this thing. But I remember really using that and going back and being like, huh, like I got to use this. And most people called me Buck. Like my high school, my college friends called me Buck. At work, they called me Buck. I was just Buck anyway. And so I remember just going back into the public access studio with a really laser sharp focus of, I am going to brand myself as Buck and start doing these segments. And so I had clips of me, Buck this, Buck that, what the Buck? And what the Buck was the one that I liked the most. And I found, because I wanted to swear, I wanted to say, joke, joke, what the f and exactly. so it was a way for me to swear at the end of this, like, what the f is going on? Yeah. With, you know, so it was logistically useful, but also good branding. And so, like, that was the thing. And I, you know, to fast forward, my cousin Ben, who was doing my volunteer public access, whatever he was doing in the booth, he would take the clips that I was asking for, like the five minute what the buck segment, and he started putting them on YouTube. So I didn't even know what YouTube was. I did not have high speed internet. I did not have a YouTube account. He just started posting these clips and I was very passive in it until it all took off. But yeah, but it was interesting to see how it was very casual, but also very deliberate. Like there was a casualness of this, but in a way I knew exactly what I was doing. I was very much laying the groundwork for a persona that would become content. Right. And then at the time when, when your cousin was posting on YouTube, then you started to post them on MySpace. Am I correct? Yeah. So, I mean, I think my first thousands of fans and viewers were me just taking these clips and embedding them onto a MySpace blog. And that's how I was engaging. Cause I don't, I, I don't remember going on YouTube and because I remember even going to my first YouTube event and not realizing there were other creators. Like, <laughs> I just thought I'm the only one doing this. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I was very successful at it originally, but it was, I wasn't really engaging in YouTube as a site, as a platform until my account got suspended and I kind of needed to claim a new channel. So that's again, part of my, yeah. Part of my YouTube origin story is my account got suspended. Why do you suspend it? I used a clip from, so you think you can dance and Dick Clark productions flagged no. it. Yeah. That's insane that, that, that they were doing that then. Like now it makes sense or way quick. The companies are way quicker at it, but the fact that they're doing it then is. And I wrote insane. them a nice email. I love your show. I was just talking about it in a productive way. And I've got like 10,000 followers. So I'm pretty big on the site and they actually got rid of the clip, but. Yeah, you know, they, oh. I mean, they 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 took away the copyright strike. Oh, nice. Yeah, this was oh, that's back in two thousand and six when it was very stressful to get a copyright strike, and just I mean, all of it was stressful and strange and unknown. You know, see, wow, see, that's interesting. I feel I, I would feel their way like there would be more loosey goosey back then. Nope, the moment something was uploaded, it was just like boom. Yeah. Oh, I guess because not uh, as many people were obviously as now, so it was a lot easier to try to like. um What's the word? Just like well, watch the stuff to make sure like 
what they're doing. Yeah, like I mean, back in the day, and now it's like all the talk shows are on YouTube. Like Ellen and Fallon, they use YouTube. Back in the day, they didn't. They didn't want to be on the internet. I mean, so many. If you watch clips of me in interviews back in two thousand and seven and two thousand and eight, everybody on TV was irritated. They were like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, like what, what is, is it? What is what is this? YouTube what is this internet new thing? media? We are old media. We are professional journalists. We have a degree in broadcast journalism. What are you doing? Yeah, I'm exactly. Making some jokes about uh, vaginas and shit, <laughs> and I'm making more money than you. But you all have a nice day. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, but you keep making fun of me, right? So, yeah. Oh, that's it's funny that you're talking about MySpace because like I think that would have been the first thing I got when I was like I think I was like seven or eight because I have an older sister so like she would have started all that stuff mm -hmm. for me. I remember MySpace was like obviously Tom or like the music on the profiles or like the custom layouts. Like MySpace was really really cool. At the My time. top eight included Lindsay Lohan and some celebrities. That again, it was a very easy way to interact with celebrities because they were using it, you know, right. and they would comment on your post and you'd be like, this can't be the real Lindsay Lohan, and then. Oh, it is. Hi. Yeah. That's nuts. Jeez. So it was funny that you were talking about um, not consuming other content. So like how far did you go into YouTube uploading yourself and just like creating yourself before you're like, oh yeah, I like this part. I'm going to start watching this person. I'm going to start watching that person. At least a year. I mean, really? I, was on, I was on all of 2006 and then there was a YouTube gathering called 777. And I remember sometime before that gathering, I did start paying attention because I noticed a lot of other popular creators were commenting on my post or wishing to engage with me. And so around that time, I definitely started engaging with others um, because it was, that's how we were gonna collaborate. And I remember there was a creator, Lisa Donovan, who was Lisa Nova. Yes, yes, I remember her. And she made a video with all these other YouTubers and we all lost our minds. Like, how did she get Smosh in there with Dave <laughs> Days and Dax Flame and what? And so I think I, that's when I realized what's going to get me noticed too is collaborating with other channels. And so I did collaborate with Ryan Higa. I did collaborate with Smosh. I did collaborate with Philip DeFranco. I did collaborate with, uh, you know, the Vlog Brothers and other yeah. people who were starting out around that time. And it's just like, we were all on AOL Instant Messenger just being like so silly and just being like, what is this? And none of us were making money yet. Like I did not make any money until December of 2007 after two full years of just uploading. And then finally around January of 2008, I got that AdSense first payment and I was like, oh my God. I because can actually make money from this. I went from making, you know, a hundred dollars every four months to, I made $10,000 in one month. And so that was the moment that I was like, Oh, Jeez, I used to, yeah. And you went nine months before you ended up quitting live nation eh? from then. Oh yeah. And I mean, I, cause I, I loved my job. I think I was also, and I, I mean, I had three reasons to leave. So I had, I was making 10, 12 K a month on YouTube. I had an HBO development deal. They were paying me a flat rate a month for that. And I also had a sponsorship with, oh my God, this Sony. So I had three big sources of income. And then I had a basically $40,000 a year day job that I was going to. And it was interesting when I would hear people in the office talking about me because I was like on the front page of a lot of newspapers or I was on the news and I would just be sitting there like, oh, and part of me didn't want anybody to know. Like that's another thing about a first generation YouTuber. I wasn't dying for my family and friends to know I was doing this. I was just doing it. Like I didn't necessarily want to draw attention to it and then i was on the front page of the new york times in 2008 and that was the moment it was like oh everybody knows and this is what i'm doing for a living and high school friends are like what is this yeah you know, it's so yeah it was, amazing it, it's so goofy though because now it is it's a career oh. it's a multi-million dollar gazillion dollar whatever and i look back and it was just so simple and so pure and so well intended and just lovely well like, that's what it is like and it's funny that you mentioned like some of the creators like back then so like my biggest ones that i watched were dave days fred dax flame sexy phil and then there's one other one probably i think i watched smosh for like the food battles dave days was like the number one guy for me i love dave days so much i was re-watching some of his old videos the other day and it's funny like he would make quick like two minute videos five hundred thousand views and like it, it, it was insane like i remember he made he made one acting like he was getting interviewed by you 
Yes. Yeah. It was like you were interviewing somebody else, but he would just cut it and make it look like it was from you. And like that would get crazy engagement, which which you, you don't get that nowadays. It's now because the algorithm, like it's so different. It's nuts. And that was an actual video reply contest I had. I think it was like seven questions. I want you to answer these questions. And I got so many replies. And right, again, when someone who was also famous on YouTube, like Dave would reply, that would boost my audience because that would draw eyeballs. Like it was very, like I remember featuring people all the time. Like we would all like put each other in our autoplay box on the top of our channel to just kind of share audience. Or if somebody who I really like put up a video that day, I would add it to my favorites. I would add it to a playlist. I would put it on my channel. And we really did enjoy, you know, spreading the word about each other. Like I, I felt very honored that I, I felt like the lucky one. I remember in 2008 and I was in the top 10 for like two years. And so I, I felt very lucky that I had become successful and all I wanted was for other people to be successful the way I was being. It wasn't like I was successful and I need to stay successful. I was successful and I thought this is so cool and I wish this for as many people as possible. And so I was glad that I was able to help promote other channels and help inspire other people to start their channel. It's so unfortunate because it's not like that now. Like most of it's so cutthroat. It's like, I want to be number one and nobody else. Yeah. And that's okay. I mean, it's like I said, it's, it's like when people, I used to do interviews between the time I stopped YouTube and now there's been so many years that I can self reflect. And I, you know, it's like when people talk about the good old days, it's like, that's again, it was a different time. It was a different creator. It was a different thing. I loved it what it was and I did really well and I love it what it is now. And I wish all that generation well, like again, and people can firmly stay in their lane. There are people who are firmly in their lane who are not bogged down in the drama and the minutia of all of it. They're just enjoying it for what it is. You know, it's like the, the, the again, it's, it's very different all these years later. And I hope it people are content creators they're doing it for reasons that they love they feel like they're adding value to the world and it's serving them in the purpose that they want you know and if you are doing it to be famous that's okay too if you're doing it for money that's okay too that will get tiring though and then again there's only so much money in the world so it's like i also i need to do this in service of some other thing too you know 100 um if you were to start youtube today what would you, what, how would you do it? I'm sure you've been asked this. I've been asked this and it's like, I will tell you in full honesty, I almost don't let my brain go there because mm -hmm. I think I will say, you know, and people who might be listening to this have not heard of me ever, or they've not heard of me in years. I will say this has been, since I've been off YouTube, the last five or six years have been the happiest, most successful, most enjoyable years of my life. And so I really want to enjoy this as long as I will. And yes. then if it's time to do something else, then I will activate that part of my brain that will decide to do something else. And I would so be shocked if you came back to YouTube or just the social media game in general. Like, obviously, I know, I know you're active on social media, but like to the degree you were, I, I would be surprised. Yeah. Cause like you said, you seem content. I am content, but I was right. content then. Like I, Fair. I was happy as a Burger King employee. I was happy making 40 K a year. My happiness has not been tied to my career. Like it really right. hasn't. Like I've enjoyed every version of myself. And so that was a chapter. Um, I could see me doing speaking. I could see me doing, you know, other things, but I, I'm not sure at 50 or 60 years old that I'm going to be like, I'd like to post three to five videos a week, but right. I think it is easier now to create content. Like if I wanted to create a real, or a TikTok or a whatever, the things that used to take me all day, I would write jokes for nine hours. I would film for 30 minutes. I would edit for two hours. I would upload it. I could have a streamlined way to be a content creator and it could be just a small part of my life versus this is all I am. You know, you could jump back into it like in a second, I think. And I think you would, you would be right back at where you were six, like, like, like followers wise and all of that. And then some. Yeah. Nowadays, I I think in 2026 you should have a one special what the buck for the 20 year anniversary. I, I I will look at my calendar and I will consider that. Yeah, like it is going to be the 20 year anniversary, and I I could see myself just uploading and just being like, hey, 
what's going on? Never you know, and you know, I still, you did start following me on Instagram. I do enjoy Instagram story. Cause I do feel like I get to be funny. I feel like I get to make some commentary and I do feel like I just get to live my life without, I'm not trying to grow an audience. I'm not trying to monetize this. I do just enjoy content for the sake of content and sharing parts of my day that way. Um, but yeah, like it almost feels like when I see old videos of myself, it's me. Like yeah. I, I get it. Like I, I see that guy, I think, and I'm here's the thing, just like I was in fifth grade. And the first time I hit upload, no one is more amused by me than me. Right. Like I, I, I think I am as funny as it gets. And I think if you're like, that's why you have to like what you're doing. And I think what the buck show for me, um, I lost interest in pop culture. And so it became challenging for me to get on the computer every day and even doing it as the comedy. Like I really just wanted to be a comedian. I use pop culture as the vehicle to be a comedian. If I was going to be a comedian now, I wouldn't be talking about celebrities. I would find way more evergreen, relatable, gay shit, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's no, it's true. Jokes about, you know, a hundred percent. So that's why I think the what the buck show needed to end because that version of me was no longer interested in being sassy, gay, pop culture, gay. Like I, I had cast myself in that role and I was not interested in playing that role anymore. So you, you, you were saying like, it kind of like it was over time that you just decided I like every day. It was like, eh, I'm not really don't really want to do this. I'm not like you sort of losing interest every day. It wasn't just one day. You're like, I'm done. No, it was definitely, I mean, I, I, I was done but I will tell you, I was very into YouTube and my YouTube persona all in 2006 to 2012. Like those were my years that I was like, eat, sleep, breathe, high as a kite, making lots of money, enjoying it, loved it all. And then I really wanted to transition to TV. I was, I was, I was feeling like I'm close to 40. I've done this for a couple years. I, I don't want to do the grind anymore. I don't want to, you know, I did some TV stuff and it was so easy. Like, it's like, yeah. it's so easy to just be a TV host. Like I, I could be a TV host or a red carpet person, like nothing. And so I really wanted to transition and I did have a lot of meetings and I did have a lot of possibilities that just didn't work out. And then, I mean, I, I became a pretty heavy drinker and I think really more than anything that derailed my YouTube career because I, you know, my life started becoming very challenging and I didn't want to deal with it. I was very upset that my YouTube career was going from, and it was embarrassing. Like I remember getting, you know, comments like this still guy still posting. Remember when he was relevant and oh my God. And da, 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 da. and it really did get in my head as much as I seem like that would never bother me. I'm a grown up. It was very disappointing to me that I let my YouTube career become so effed up and it was my my doing and then the drinking just was the kind of light my life on fire and disrupt you know my marriage ended my career ended and i just kind of needed a hard reset so right. yeah and, and i yeah. didn't change a thing but i looking back at it i'm like what happened at the end oh yeah i became a drunk too <laughs> so it was you know, really like i literally was drinking so heavily that i did not have the brain or the charisma or the wits about me to pivot and take the good advice I was getting, I could have kept going. I had another five or 10 years of me if I wanted it. I didn't want it. No, no. And it, it's again, it's like, it's like a TV show that lasts yeah. a couple extra seasons yeah. too long, right? It's good. Right. And it was very successful and it did very well. And I'm nothing but proud of it. How long have you been sober now? About six and a half years. Nice. Congrats. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks. A um, lot. Go. Do you, I know you say you don't regret anything, but do nope. you kind of look back and think maybe I could have nope. like stopped a year before? No, I no, it all like everything. I don't wish I stopped drinking sooner. I don't wish I left my marriage sooner. I don't wish that I did anything on YouTube with different. Cause again, one of the things I've learned over the years is when you argue with reality, you lose every time. So I don't need to wish anything different that happened 20 years ago or 20 minutes ago. Right. So even if I get off this podcast and I watch it back, I'm not going to sit there and be like, I should have explained that differently. Or I wish that I had put on a different shirt. I did what I did. Right. And I, I like feel that. Good about that, it. that is a good way to live. Otherwise it sucks. Yeah. Fair. It must um, be very challenging. 
you're just always going to live with regret at that point. I have no regrets. At 48, mm. almost 49 years old, I'm very comfortable with the choices I've made, and I feel very good about them, and yeah. I wouldn't change a damn thing. That's awesome. Um, you're talking about how you did like a, a lot of live TV. Um, and you were on with Kelly Ripa, which was pretty sick. How was that? Did you like it? Easy. Again, that was easy. Like there yeah. was me. It was easy for me to just go be on live TV. They give you a list of topics, and you just talk. Like everything about that week, that was one of the most relaxing weeks of my life in many ways. Like nothing about that was stressful. Like and, was and just, how's Kelly? Delightful, lovely, yeah. supportive, encouraging, uh, funny, 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 grateful. Like she knows that's a big gig and you can tell she is grateful and enjoys it every day. And now she's on with her husband. And right. I mean, she is just, she is someone who she, she designed a beautiful, wonderful life um, for herself and to be in that orbit briefly was magnetic and powerful because was that she, at the time that they were looked that they were in between from when Regis left. Yes. And so, I mean, in my brain, I really thought they could pick me now, of course, I mean, already, why not? I mean, I thought, I mean, I did it. I did. I killed it. But right. at the same time, you know, uh, they already, I believe probably had hired Michael Strahan mm. and they already had the path, but I, I like, and I'm competitive and ambitious enough to, I wanted to believe I actually had a chance at that. So, you no, know, I mean, again, was, like, again you, a great you, experience. Did so well. Why would you not think that? Right. Hey, again, a great experience. Yeah. Like my, I, I look back at my life and there were so many moments um, that I do see pictures of myself or I do see old videos and I do think, wow, that was really cool. And I will tell you, I don't regret it, but I could have enjoyed a lot of it more. Right. I do. Fair, think, fair. I, I do. I could have definitely been less in my head about some of it. I could have been less, you know, I definitely, there are, cause I see it now and I'm like, God, that's so cool. And I think, did that feel cool at the time? And maybe Again, if I, it would have felt cooler now if I, if I let myself let it feel as cool as it was. Because you're I probably just going through the motions, right? I just wanted to downplay it because I just wanted, I did, I didn't want to, you know, psych myself out of it. I didn't want to develop any sort of imposter syndrome. And I also just wanted to seem cool. Like, this is cool. But I'm like, I did have some big experiences that I think I forget about until my father will show me a picture and I'll be like, oh, that was fun. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah. that's like the um, when you hosted the red carpet of the Teen Choice Awards. Like, I, there's that clip with you and Selena just chatting. Like, you guys are best friends. You guys are hugging. She's like holding your arm. It's like you guys knew each other for 20 years. She loved me. She, she loved me. seems like the nicest person in the world. She loved me, and she actually made a YouTube video once, and she talked about like her five favorite YouTube videos, and she picked one of mine. And she is just someone who like she got the joke. Like, I would make jokes about her, and she thought they were funny. I'm like. Mm. And and when I when she walked away for like she was giddy meeting me and talking with me and then she walked away and she said I wish they were all like Bach yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you, yeah you quoted that so, in the video yeah it I was know, that, just, that. she was just lovely and warm and I I'm so excited for her like I don't know her I know her in passing from things like that but I do know she has worked so hard as an actress and as a singer and as a former Disney star to just carve out a career for herself and i i admire her and i celebrate her and i'm just again as a fan i'm delighted for her success yeah um, i was actually really excited because uh yesterday she announced that they're coming back with the wizard way replace i'm so excited i i, I, I the second she shared the news i sent to my fiance i was like because we watch disney plus like we'll watch that so raven sweet life mm -hmm. zach cody like we're at 12 mm -hmm. again so yep. that, that I'm, I'm i'm pretty excited for yeah um I don't know if you've gotten this comparison before and like, excuse my ignorance of like, it's rude or if you don't like it, did you ever get compared to Perez Hilton? Um, yes. I mean, in my first like year, I, some of the reviews about me would say I was like a video Perez Hilton in a way. And I mean, I feel like the comparison is valid in that we were both a bit gossip reporters. I, I do think, you know, the intent of his website back in the day, he's had growth since then was to like break news and maybe, you know, shake things up. My intention was always just to be a comedian. So I never wanted to out anybody or ruin anybody's life or seem cruel. And so I understand the comparison, but I also think the content I was doing was certainly different.
I think so. And, and I feel like he was a lot more intense with his content. Like you said, like, I think he liked being like in the mud, in the drama. I don't, I didn't never really saw that from you. No, my, I always wanted the joke. I always wanted the comedy. I like the joke for me. What was ever funny was what I was going to say. So like when I'm about to review high school musical, it doesn't matter if I like it or I hate it what makes a good joke. So like, that's what my brain was always wired to. Like if I was going to make fun of something, it had to be in service of the joke I was making. Like Miley Cyrus, like I love Miley or Glee. So it's like as a Glee fan, when I'm about to recap Glee, it's not like I'm Michael Buckley, a TV critic. It's I'm Michael Buckley. I'm a comedian. And so I have to think about what's going to make the audience laugh. Mm -hmm. So that was always what I was looking for. I was always looking for the joke. I love that. And it's it's like you didn't you didn't try like I know obviously like you had people that were the butt end of the joke, but it like I don't know. To me, it wasn't like you were like being rude about it. Like I mean, obviously you you would have some things you would said that were like maybe a little over the top, yeah. like funny and rude and crude, but it's like you didn't deliberately it didn't seem like every single joke you just tried to like get at somebody, like poke at someone, you know what I mean? I hope not, but I mean, I definitely was, you know, mean and I was sassy and I was fresh. And I think, you know, as I evolved by 2010, my content had gotten less mean. I think those first ver those first three years, I was going for a bit of the shock. And again, I grew up with like Howard Stern or shock radio comedians where it's like, you want to say something to get a headline. So, I mean, I knew that and I knew when I would do the title, if it was shocking, it would get views. Right. But I do think as I settled into my persona and my brand of comedy, after the first like two years, it did, it was never necessarily cruel. I'm sure in my first two years, I said things that if I watched it back now, it would be like, oh God. Yeah. But, you know, again, I, you know. I was going back to look at your old videos and you deleted what? All of them? 2000, most of them. Yeah. I mean, I think all of the What the Buck show, except maybe three episodes, have been yeah. privated. I do think in 2020, I had been off YouTube for about three years then. And it was the time that people started canceling YouTubers for previous content. And I just thought, I know I said something back in the day that someone could easily take a clip and make it sound bad. And I wish to be employable in the future. And I wish to have a light, a light outside of this. And so I just quietly hid my channel and I did a blog post saying, I am not going to comb this and look for things. I know there were videos with Ryan Higa. It was all gay and Asian jokes. Like right. that's all it was. Right. And so if someone looked at it now, they would be like, this is awful. This right. was scripted. And Ryan and I agreed upon this. But in 2024, people would find that very offensive. I don't feel defensive about that. I'm not like, oh, you all need to tough it up. And back in the day, I accept the fact things I said 10 years ago are not funny now and I know better and I do better. And so right. I'm not embarrassed, but I also, I think I wrote in my blog post, it's almost like I moved out of my house and now I, I, I feel weird if I leave my house open for people to see. I'm not a current YouTuber. I'm not wishing to attract new viewers. And so I think it feels irresponsible for me to just leave 2000 videos for with no context. And so I will believe me. I believe I will unprivate them over the years as Please I watch do. them. I will. Um, I just haven't had the time or interest in doing that. But uh, yes, that again, I'm not. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. I just know better, and I do better. And I definitely said things that would be problematic. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, <clears throat> all the original YouTubers who didn't. Like even Fred, who acted as a kid, I guarantee you there was things that he said he probably shouldn't have. Yeah. Like I, I think about SNL and like there's a Project Runway skit where the character is going fierce, fierce, tranny, fierce, fierce. And now no one would say tranny. No, like I used to say, you know, call things or call yes. things gay, gay or and i mean when i would review <clears throat> american idol we i would just be like that's the fat one that's the gay one that's the asian one not funny but also just very much of the time of how people just very bluntly refer to things like simon cowell on american idol was doing that and so when i was reviewing that it felt natural for me to stereotype the contestants and again in, in under the guise of comedy 
I'm not saying it was funny. I'm just saying in the time, I, nobody was commenting, this is offensive, delete this. Everybody was just laughing. And so everyone, everyone was in on it. Right. And yeah. so again, I, am, I, yeah. I accept the fact that it's not funny and I, I funny in 2024. And again, no regrets, but awareness now that I would not make those same jokes. No, a hundred percent. And that did it take you? Was it one of those things where you just click all and then private? Did you have to go through each one? No, I think no. It's like every like all fifty. Like you can see fifty to a hundred videos at a time. So you even just, that's not that many for as many as you had. It was still it was still labor intensive, but it was you know it was yeah. it was a nice thing to do. Like I said it was a nice and writing a post about it in a reflective way versus a going off quite like I did this. This is why I did it. And I feel good about it. And I just wanted to share. Right. Um, but yeah, I think someday over the years when I've got a couple hours, I'll start on privating some or occasionally like maybe five times a year, I will go, I will download one and I'll post it on Instagram and I'll just be like, look at this guy. Yeah. Like, yeah. You'd be, you'd be a really cool video. You com like doing commentary on one of your videos. I think so. I think, I mean, I still delight in myself. I think I'm like watching an alien and I, <laughs> but I see that glimmer in my eye of like, huh? It's interesting just to see it is like home movies and it's right. like, I, and I'm still a grown up. It's not like when you see a 16 year old YouTuber who's now 30, it's shocking. I am a 48 year old who you saw at 32. Thanks to my wig and my Botox. I look basically the same. But you, know. you know, I did not know that you wore wigs until I saw you on a podcast recently. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, always i ripped it up in 20 something in that back in the day i like lifted it up and showed but i re yeah like no it's i've worn a wig since 2000 oh god no since 1999 so i really yeah yeah hey you got some good ones because i never thanks. noticed thanks yeah it's all that's good. awesome uh it's funny that you talked about um unprivating them because to me like when i go because i'll go back and, like i said watch a dave days video that i watched when i was a kid and i love or like a dax flame or whatever it's like watching a time capsule because like the comments from 16 years ago are still there you know what i mean like it, it, it's just weird to do that mm -hmm. and you'd mentioned about earlier about replying to videos i remember like now everyone's so careful about the perfect edit the perfect music under there the uh, the best intro but like then you just like make a 30 second video you replying to somebody and like that was normal and like it would get hundreds of thousands of views because this is how it worked by then so it's so interesting how different youtube is now yeah i love the, the the reply the video reply so if a popular youtuber like i made a video saying i want a new opening theme song 300 people made videos for me and i loved watching them and that helped me engage with people but like it's funny because i remember jenna marbles made her first videos on like that webcam and they were very grainy the moment she did like an HD video, everyone was like, I don't like this. I like your, I was like, what? Like, like really? the audience, the audience was irritated that she had seemed to upgrade her content. They, they really enjoyed the kind of low budget nature of those first creators, you know? I can't remember who it was that I watched, but I rewatched someone's old video the other day and they're like, yeah, now, like, now it, this is an HD. And I was, I was sitting there. I was like, it might've been me because that might've been one of the only videos I that I still have up. It was you. And when you said it and I was like, that's it's insane. Like, this, show now this was HD. a big deal. HD. I, I mean, I had to get better <laughs> lights. I had a better camera. I had a better, whatever, like everything was, it was interesting how different it looked. And I mean, I look slick too. Like that's, if you want to trace the origins the roots of the success of the what the buck show that first year and a half people really thought i was like a tv show like i think they thought i was on some like gay you know other maybe where is this show but because i presented myself like i'm michael buckley and you're tuning into the what the buck show there wasn't a lot of that on youtube so i think there was sort of a you know a legitimacy to it seem like what i was doing and 100%. then I mean, it is on my Wikipedia page and I do talk about it in interviews, but I really was the first person who successfully did call the action. So when I said, please like, please comment, please subscribe, everybody started doing that because the day I did it, I had the four top rated, most commented videos and everybody started being like, who is this guy and what is he doing? Oh, and that works. Uh, and so I, I do, I love to take credit for that, but why I, not? 
it is traceable back to me. I, I don't know if I did the first call to action, but I did the first successful call to action. And then the next week, everybody had a bit of an intro and an outro mm. that said, make sure you're rating this video. Oh, there goes the, oh, there we go. The, 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 there's your own effects right there. I love yeah. that. No, but that's, that's awesome that you did that. I mean, and it's genius because like, now it makes sense because like why wouldn't you but back then the fact that you were one of the nobody people, was like, asking people would say to me at, when i would go to youtube events and speak in 2007 and 8 people would say how do you have so many subscribers and i would say i asked and honestly all the businesses were right because they would just post videos and clips and not engage and then suddenly people were saying if you like my channel please subscribe what like you just have to ask. I mean, and and that kind of makes sense that people would just be like, oh yeah, because like I'm sure a lot of people are watching videos like, oh oh wait, I should subscribe. I didn't even think about that. You're they're yeah. so like engaged in the video, maybe you know yeah. what I mean. That nobody huh. was asking, and then I started asking, and I got like lots of subscribers, and then everybody started asking, and so it is. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I got two more things for you, and then I'll let you go. Um, one, and I feel like you may not answer this just because I answer all questions. I can't. Okay. Think. Okay. You might not give the answer that I'm thinking you will. Um, if uh, I know I start asked you about like, if you start YouTube today, but so back then you would collab with people like Dave days or like Lisa Nova and stuff like that. What would your, are you watching YouTube right now? Are you consuming content? You're not. not so like, you don't know any, like the big YouTube. I, I mean, I know Mr. Beast cause my niece and nephew watch Mr. Watch Beast and they, uh, but other than that, no, I don't really know who anybody is. I, the only thing I watch is like bootleg Broadway shows, bootleg, uh, you know, figure skating and gymnastics. Like I'm definitely, there's not any content that I am watching. I don't know who anybody is. That is crazy. All. You went from, instead of zero to a hundred, you went from a hundred to zero. Like that's just like, you're, you, boom, you disappeared. That's Done. insane. Done. Well, I, well, cause I was going to ask who would you want to collab with now if you're doing it? So we'll just say Mr. Beast because that's the only uh, No, you know what? I, I would, I always will say my friends, uh, you know, I honestly, I'll say Philip DeFranco because Philip DeFranco is someone we were contemporaries. We were both doing entertainment news at the same time. And, uh, and I married him. I married him and his wife, Lindsay. And oh, no way. Phil is someone who he really, I mean, all these years later, he figured it out. He turned it into a business. He was able to turn this talking head persona into this enormous thing that still exists. I was not able or willing or interested in doing that. So, I mean, I'd love to sit down with Phil and talk. I'd love, I saw Anthony from Smosh interviewing um, Dane from The Annoying Orange. I would love to sit down with like Anthony from Smosh and just talk about like old YouTube stuff. So I'd, I'd love to collaborate with like an old, my generation YouTuber who is still killing it. I think that'd be fun. It would be pretty cool if Anthony had you on a, I spend a day with, cause yeah. that's like, that's that series he has. That would be pretty cool. And it, I mean, speaking of them, like he, the fact that he came back to Smosh was huge mm -hmm. and that they got it back. The two of them, everything about that is wonderful. Awesome. So, yeah. and then like for me, like you, there's like, for, like you, there's some content or content creators. You just don't see anymore from your time. Like Dax flame. I follow him on Instagram. He barely ever posts up um lucas from like that does fred he obviously completely stopped doing fred dave days will drop music every so often but like that's really it like i've tried to talk, get in contact with dave it is so difficult so it's like that era a lot of people from that era like you just kind of like went off and was like okay hey, i'm done now i did it i don't need it anymore dave if you see this come on this <laughs> yeah 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 i appreciate that but like it, it it's interesting that and then but then you look at people like smosh and like phil who like kept going and like, hey, carl i don't really see him anymore who? Shay Carl. I think he and his family are still vlogging occasionally. Uh -huh. Like I follow him and his wife on the Instagram and I believe they still make videos occasionally. I think not I the way they were. No, I don't think, I don't think it's a daily vlog thing, but I mean, yeah. that seems exhausting and tedious and not a, you know, in some of these family channels too, like I, oh. I have very competing thoughts about doing that, but I mean, I, 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 I support people and their choices, but I also, I've seen some of the consequences of that. And that makes me a little like, uh, no, some, yeah. some of it. So like, just like yeah. dirty, you know what I mean? Just yeah. like how they act and stuff. Um, absolutely. Last thing I swear, Michael Buck Buckley in 2024, we talked about him as a kid. What is Michael Buckley doing now in 2024? Oh my God. So my life is so surprising to me. I feel, uh, if you had asked me 10 years ago, like, what would you be doing? Like, I would not have dreamed this life for myself. 
I live in Denver, Colorado. It is a beautiful place to live. The weather is amazing. The people are amazing. Um, I'm in the best physical and emotional shape of my life. I exercise a lot. I am part of a flag football community, the Denver gay lesbian flag football community. And I just got back from Las Vegas where I captained a competitive team. And when we won the A division Sin City Classic, shout out to Denver Summit. So I'm on the leadership council of my church. I go to a beautiful and affirming church called Highlands Church, where uh, we love you unconditionally as is. And so I have a football community. I have a church community. I work for Arrow Senior Living. I am their chief feelings officer. I am in charge of emotional intelligence and leadership development. And I'm on one-on-one -on -one coaching calls all day. And it's just so fulfilling. And I always describe it as my life feels so small now, but it feels bigger than it's ever been. I, I just, and I also, I'm at the point in my life where I just, I love being me. Like I'm 48 years old. I've had a very full life. And if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, like this has been great. I'm not, I enjoy getting out of bed. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I enjoy every moment of my life and that is every day. And I just, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for my time on YouTube. I'm grateful that you remember me fondly and wish to talk to me about it. And I'm grateful for my, my current life. And I, I'm not sure what I'll be doing in 10 years, but I will be enjoying it. <laughs> I love it. And I, 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 I don't know why I obviously I don't know you personally, but I feel like it'll be completely different than what you're doing right now. I guess, I guess you can email me in 10 years and say, <laughs> yeah, exactly. On the exactly. podcast for our, where, where is he now? Now? Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, I speaking of grateful, I'm grateful for, for you being on here because I really do appreciate it. I did want to give you a quick shout out. One thing you do in your Instagram stories I've noticed is, uh, I think it was yesterday, you said like today is January 20 or 18th, 2024. And that's the only time that you will live on this day, which is really, really cool way to look at it. An amazing way to look at it. So I do think so much of our emotional distress is past focused. This didn't work out the way I want it or it's future focused. I have anxiety about that, but honestly, this is the only Friday, January 19th at 4 56 PM I'm going to have with you and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm not looking back. I'm not looking forward. I'm right here and I'm really present and I'm savoring and enjoying and I do, I am someone, I enjoy life for what it is, not what I think it should be. I am thankful in all circumstances. I love myself unconditionally. I love life unconditionally. And I just feel so lucky that this is the life that I get to live. And I wish that for everybody. That's awesome. I love that so much. Well, Michael, thank you so much for coming on here. You fulfilled a dream of mine since I was 12 from watching you and now it's 27. It's amazing to be able to chat with you. So thank you so much for coming You're on welcome. here. You're welcome. I had a wonderful time. I appreciate that. I'll talk to you later. And that was the Quaid Bar Show.